Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Research Intelligence, Open Research, Open Data, and Open Publishing, a webinar co-hosted by University of Hong Kong Libraries and EBSCO. I'm Ethan Huang, EBSCO Marketing Manager of Asia. My colleague, Regional Manager, Abel Liu, uh, and I will be the moderators today. Before I hand over to our speakers, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. First, Today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will be able to share a link with you after the event is complete. You can also download the presentation slides from this link. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it with colleagues or faculties. Second, we also invite your comments and questions. Uh, please look at the Q&A chat box on your screen. Each session will have five minutes for Q&A. But if you think of a question for any speaker at any point, just type in there and we will hold it for the discussion portion at the end of the event. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Lenny Tatman, who is going to start today's presentation. Lenny, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on the time zone. And many thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I'm looking forward to the questions and um, other the presentations from the other speakers. Um, and I just want to say as a quick note that it is a particular pleasure to be in the same session with GigaScience because they were the second uh, publisher to recognize the importance of protocols.io way back in 2015, soon after we launched and uh, partnered with us. And it has been an amazing relationship and it's an absolute pleasure um, to be in the same session. So with that, I will share the screen and do a quick introduction of protocols.io, why we created it and some of the key features and then take any questions. Um, I'm personally a geneticist by training, uh, both experimental wet lab work and computational uh, biology. And it was literally my postdoc that inspired me to go into create, uh, helping to co-found protocols.io um, in that I uh, spent a year and a half of the postdoc fixing just one step of the method that I was using. So instead of one microliter, it needed five. Instead of a 15 minute incubation, it needed one hour. And after that year and a half of tweaking that single cell microscopy method, I realized that it's not a new technique. It's not a new paper. It's just a correction of something that's previously published. So I don't get any credit for the work. And everybody else who's using that same method is either getting completely misleading results or has to spend a year or two rediscovering that small modification um, and it's a huge waste and it's a huge delay for science and waste of time and resources um, and that led to my uh, obsession with creating a central place to share such knowledge but my favorite way of starting to talk about this issue is by highlighting this tweet from a postdoc at the University of California, Riverside, who is reading a research paper. And in the method section, uh, he sees, you know, he's looking for a protocol in a 97 paper. And it says, as described in a previous paper in 96, finds the 1996 paper as described in 1987, finds 87 paper, it's paywalled. And that is a, common and frustrating experience. Uh, this is from a biologist. Uh, here's a, one from a physicist, uh, very similar. Devices were fabricated as previously described, previously described, previously described. And the original reference says devices were fabricated with conventional methods, which of course makes it impossible to know exactly what was done and how to repeat the work. Um, I have a long list of exactly such complaints um, that I bookmark uh, over the years, and it would take me the full hour to just go through those tweets. 
but I do want to highlight um, another serious study of this, which is the Reproducibility Project Cancer Biology, which was uh, an over a million dollar effort to repeat experiments from 50 um, high profile cancer papers. And uh, a year and a half or two years after that effort started, uh, reporting on it, Ed Young wrote, the journalist Ed Young wrote in The Atlantic about that effort. The hardest part by far was figuring out exactly what the original labs actually did. Science papers come with method sections that theoretically ought to provide recipes for doing the same experiments, but often those recipes are incomplete missing out important steps, details, or ingredients. In some cases, the recipes are not described at all. Researchers simply cite an earlier study that used a similar technique. And what this whole effort highlighted is that it's really hard, um, not just to figure out what is described in a research paper. Reproducibility is not just hard in published papers, but even inside a lab, it's very difficult. So when when the people doing this uh, reproducibility project went to the labs that did the original work, those professors and scientists couldn't find the work either. Um, as it says here, often the person who did the work is no longer in the lab. And a year and a half later, that whole effort, instead of replicating 50 papers, stopped at just 18 um, to a large degree because it's so hard to repeat what other people have done and find out uh, what exactly they've done. Um, and this is, this is exactly what we try to improve uh, and make easier, um, both for external reproducibility, which is the published paper, but also internal reproducibility within research labs, within the groups doing the research long before you're publishing, making it easier to organize and collaborate um, on the method development. So our mission is to make it easy to share method details before, during, and after publication. And if the internet cooperates, I'd like to do just a really quick demo of the key um, highlights of the features on protocols.io. So we are a platform for collaborating on methods, um, both organizing for yourself and privately collaborating securely with your collaborators and for sharing openly. So the business model is very similar to GitHub. If you're sharing openly, it's free, it's open access, free to read, free to publish. And if you want to collaborate privately, that's when universities sign up for campus-wide licenses or an individual group can pay for the researchers to use it. So private use is subscription. If you're sharing publicly, it's free. And every single protocol, I'm going to highlight the public protocols um, at this point. So we launched in 2014. And at this point, there are about 9,000 public protocols, 33,000 private ones on protocols.io. And every single protocol starts out privately, just like on Google Docs. It's yours, only you can see it. And then using the sharing, you decide who to share it with, what kind of permissions to give to them. And if and when you're ready, you can make it public so that other people can cite it and you can get credit uh, for your work. And one of my favorite examples is uh, this protocol from a researcher in Australia. And if what you can notice right away is that the protocols are not static web pages or PDFs. They're dynamic and interactive. You can add videos to the steps, components. Uh, we try to really make it easy in, the, in our editor to capture all the details you need for reproducibility. Which data set did you use? What are the materials? Where did you order the reagents? What software did you use? Which parameters? And every step you can see, you can mouse over it and you can ask a question on it. And here, if you can see it on step 24, it says to do something for two dash two minutes. Timer says seven minutes. And if you were cooking, this would be a confusing instruction. And one of the scientists looking at this 
clicked on the step and asked, uh, wait, what does it mean two to two minutes? Should it be two to seven minutes? This question went to the author and everybody who is using this protocol, the author quickly responded, whoops, that's a typo. It should be two to three minutes. And this is, instead of answering the same question by email over and over, you're sort of building a public FAQ right on the protocol without changing the protocol itself. Um, you're building a public FAQ. And then because we have versioning, with a click of a button, Megan was able to create a new version, fix that step. And everybody who is looking at this protocol, if you go to the drop down at the end of the title, can click the compare button and see exactly which steps changed from version one to version four, what's the same, what's different. And importantly, every single protocol, public or private, can be uh, used as a template so you can copy it, uh, fork it in GitHub vocabulary. And if you're working with liver tissues and I'm working with kidneys, we might have slight differences in the way we process our tissues. And so what's five microliters for you might be six microliters for me. And um, it's easy on protocols.io to treat every protocol as a template, click the fork button, make modifications. It becomes private to you. You can edit it as you use it in your group, with your equipment, with your cell line, with your research topic. And then if and when you're ready, you can share it. And we try to preserve and give credit to both the original authors and the authors of the fork. And one of the last uh, items that I wanted to highlight is um, relevant to wet lab and uh, field protocol. So about uh, 5 to 10% of all of the 9,000 public protocols on protocols.io are computational bioinformatics pipelines. 90% are wet lab uh, field techniques. And for those, this run button is really useful because it allows you to step through the method as you're performing it at the bench or um, in, in the field on that particular day. So you can see what your progress is through it, where you are right now. It's sort of like a checklist cooking app. You can see what you're doing next. Um, if you're running it on your tablet, on Samsung or iPad, you can click the timer um, and start running it right on the iPad in the fume hood. And importantly, if you change anything, you can click edit on that step and have a record and say, you know, today I actually did it for 25 minutes instead of 30 because I'm working with a different cell line. Um, and you have a record if you save it, of exactly how you ran it on that particular day. So um, being mindful of time, there is just one other thing that I want to highlight, which is that not only can you share protocols publicly, and I said there's already 9,000 public ones on protocols.io, but you can organize them into communities. You can create groups, public or private, on protocols.io, and you can collaborate with other researchers and you can create spaces where you put in these protocols. And so you can see this is uh, a community that got started for obvious reasons about a year ago um, to exchange methods around coronavirus uh, testing and sequencing and research. And you can see there is now over 500 members uh, in this workspace. There are hundreds of workspaces where researchers are collaborating with each other. And if you join a workspace like this, if you're working on these methods, you will always be up to date. You'll know when a new version of a protocol is updated, when somebody adds a new technique. You can see when there are discussions. So you can see there are 500 discussions happening in this group. And one of the things, um, one of the things that I want to highlight is that the very first protocol that came into this group is uh, from a group at University of Birmingham. And 
what's special about it is this was the very first coronavirus protocol on protocols.io. And you can see that forking functionality, it's actually forked from an Ebola virus sequencing protocol that the same group shared in September of 2019 before coronavirus. And they took the time, they shared 100 plus steps um, of how to sequence the Ebola uh, virus. And then when they modified this method to work with coronavirus, with just a few clicks, they were able to fork and share rapidly with everybody um, exactly how they're doing the sequencing on the coronavirus. And again, that compare functionality applies. So if you click compare, you can see what they were doing with Ebola, what they modified for coronavirus. And the key difference is that instead of 10 microliters of Ebola RNA, they're using 11 microliters of uh, coronavirus RNA. And then again, you can see which steps stayed the same, which ones are different. And it um, it's just a beautiful example. Um, you can see that there are, just in a year, there are 140,000 views um, of just this protocol, right? A lot of people, we try to expose all of the metrics there are a lot of people that have exported it, over 2,000 exports, a lot of people making those forks and modifying it based on the equipment in their lab, <clears throat> a lot of discussions, and you can see it's being versioned. And this whole um, coronavirus method development community, to me, is inspiring as an open access advocate. It's inspiring to see how quickly scientists have been sharing, how open uh, it has been, and at the same time, it reminds me of just how strange it is that in our world, we make exceptions for pandemics. So when there's Ebola, we try to share openly and fast. When there's coronavirus, when there's Zika, and then we somehow go back to the same slow way of doing science. And I hope after COVID-19 that we move away with a lesson that this is how all science should work because whether it's coronavirus or malaria or cancer, uh, pediatric cancer case, those patients don't have the luxury of time, whether it's a pandemic or not. And uh, to me, it feels sort of unconscionable that um, after outbreaks, after disasters, we somehow say, okay, we can now go back to slower science. And I hope we never do that. And I hope we keep sharing preprints, we keep practicing open science, we keep publishing open access and trying to make our research more reproducible. And with that, um, I am done with the demo, um, just in two more minutes before I take questions. So it's been 16 minutes. I just wanted to say that there are now, um, following the example of Giga Science and Genetic Society of America, which were the first two publishers uh, to partner with us. There are now over 500 journals that explicitly recommend protocols.io um, and author submission guidelines when you're trying to publish a paper. There are more and more funders that recommend or require protocols.io and many universities have started to sign up um, for the private collaboration for the campus-wide licenses for both teaching and research um, on campuses. Um, if there are any librarians in the audience, we take preservation uh, exports and mirroring very seriously. I'd be happy to answer questions about that. You can cite everything, there is a DOI, and we really try hard to make sure that um, people cite your work and that it's visible, discoverable, and that you get credit if you're sharing publicly, you get credit for method development. And the last thing before I stop is one of my favorite examples of what happens when you are sharing <clears throat> openly when you publish. And this is a conversation between a researcher in Chile who is looking for a method uh, to do RNA extraction from primary cortical neuron cultures. And another scientist from UCSF says, from University of San Francisco says, oh, from the methods on protocols.io, here's the one that should work for you. And what I love about this example is that 
if you look at this protocol, it turns out that it actually is part of a paper in Giga Science. And I swear to you, I'm not using this example just because Scott is here and is Giga Science is part of the session. This is the example that I always use in my presentations because the authors of this paper, not only did they make their paper more reproducible and move away from that contact author for details, or we use the slightly modified version of what you saw in the other paper, what I showed in the beginning, they made their paper more reproducible, but also because they put it in a central repository like protocols.io, they make it discoverable, you can fork it, and you can be sure that this researcher from Chile um, would not be reading a paper on parasites of stickleback fish. This is not a cortical neuron culture paper, right? So the authors shared it, and this method is now being reused, not just for the parasites of the fish, but for cortical neuron cultures. And that's what repositories enable. That's what um, open science, when it's done right, um, accelerates. And uh, I would like to thank the amazing team at protocols.io and our partners, uh, Genetic Society of America, Giga Science, Public Library of Science, and the funders, Gordon Betty Moore Foundation and Chen Zuckerberg uh, in particular for generous support. And I will stop there. And I think I have five minutes for questions. Yes, many thanks for Lenny's sharing. It's great to know the benefits of protocols.io to the researchers and faculty. And we received um, several questions. So the question number one, how does credit work with forking of protocols? That's the question number one. And question number two, how do software components, for example, our package fit within the protocol system? I saw a uh, Scott answer part um, in the chat box, but we would like to learn from Lenny's uh, insight. Lenny, please. Yes, um, so the first question about, um, and by the way, I love questions. If uh, you want to ask something, I'll put my email in the chat. So feel free to email Lenny at protocols.io if we don't get to it uh, in the next couple of minutes. Um, what I wanted to say is for forking, we always make it right under the title of the protocol, very clear where it was forked from. There's also a fork tab on every public protocol that lets you see what the evolution is, what's the original, and what this version is based off of. And when you publish a fork, we give you a pop-up asking you to also describe what's different in this case. But we try to <clears throat> make it very obvious what the branching and what the evolution of the protocol is so that both research groups um, can get credit. Um, ideally, you, you might even uh, cite both protocols. In terms of, in terms of um, R packages or Jupyter Notebooks, uh, we don't have direct integrations uh, with CodeOcean or Jupyter Notebooks. Um, we are not a substitute for GitHub, so you would still put your code on GitHub, you'd still put it into Jupyter Notebook, but we are a good place. We see a lot of computational uh, pipelines that are shared. Uh, also, Giga Science has beautiful examples. Thank you, Scott, uh, for highlighting those. Um, we, we are a good place to say, here's where the code is. Here's what we did first, how we processed the FASTA files and the DNA sequences. Here are the scripts that we ran. Here's the software we used to analyze with the following cutoffs, parameters. Um, so you're capturing the workflow, um, but you would link out from the individual steps, you would link out to the code on GitHub um, or to the packages and software that you're using. Um, but also if you have scripts, MATLAB files, Python scripts, you can attach them directly into the steps of the workflow as well. And that's very easy to do in the editor. Thank you, Lenny. Uh, all right, I think it may take a bit time for everyone to warm up to ask more questions. So I will hand the session over to Robert first. But if you think of um, a question for any speaker at any point, just type in the Q&A chat box there and we will hold it for the discussion portion. 
at the end of the event. Okay, Robert, you are good to go. All right, thank you, Abel. Uh, thank you for that first presentation, Lenny. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, really appreciate um, you attending this event. And again, special thanks to the organizers for uh, for putting this event together. Uh, it's real, uh, real honor and pleasure to to be here and uh, present to you today. And so what I would like to do is pivot to, uh, what I would like to do in my presentation is introduce you to, um, to Code Ocean. And this is another, um, this is another uh, software partnership that EBSCO has entered into uh, alongside protocols.io. And my role at EBSCO is uh, to work directly with our, our partners at Code Ocean and protocols.io. Um, to bring these uh, these platforms to uh, universities and research institutions uh, all around the world. And so what I would like to do today is introduce you all to Code Ocean, uh, tell you a little bit about the idea behind Code Ocean, uh, what it is, why it's important, um, how it supports uh, some of the broader initiatives that we're discussing today around open research, open data, open publishing, and, uh, and like Lenny with protocols, I would like to uh, show you a little bit about the core functionality to, uh, to the Code Ocean platform. It will by no means be exhaustive, uh, but hopefully it will give you a better idea of what the platform is, what it's all about and how it works. Okay, so I like to start, when I, whenever I do present on Code Ocean, I like to start here because I think it is important to contextualize Code Ocean. You know, what is Code Ocean and what's so special about it? How does it change the game? And so what you're seeing on the left-hand side, uh, the numbered steps are really the traditional steps that a computational researcher would have to go through in order to run their code and generate their results. I imagine many of you would be uh, quite familiar with this process. So first, of course, you have to find the code and the data and that can be done relatively uh, quickly today. Uh, you can pull those right off of GitHub, uh, but then the real work begins, right? Because then you have to make sure that you have the right hardware uh, installed on your local machine. Uh, you have to make sure that you have the right uh, computational environment set up. Um, you need to make sure that you not only have the appropriate language, uh, but you have the appropriate version of that particular language, importing various files, installing dependencies where one file is dependent on another file and another file, et cetera. And eventually uh, you get to step seven where you can run your code and generate your results. And I think a useful way of thinking about Code Ocean is that Code Ocean really streamlines this entire process that I just described so that all researchers have to do is run their code and generate the results all from a simple web browser and so in this way, Code Ocean removes uh, really all of these interoperability barriers for researchers, um, making it far easier for researchers to collaborate on their computational, uh, their computational research, to speed up the pace at which they're conducting their computational research, um, and making it easier than ever for researchers to, uh, to share their data and share their research. And so what is Code Ocean? Code Ocean is very similar in concept to what Lenny described with protocols.io. It's a cloud-based platform uh, that allows uh, any researcher to write code in any programming language with all of the computational tools and resources um, that they need already at their disposal within a single, uh, within a single platform. And so researchers are able to use Code Ocean internally <clears throat> within the lab, within the classroom, uh, within institutions or across institutions to easily create and share and collaborate and preserve their computational work. Um, they can keep their uh, compute capsules, which I will get into. Uh, they can keep them uh, private. They all start out privately, or they can decide to uh, publish their, uh, their work in Code Ocean on, uh, on the platform. And briefly, in terms of technology, the technology used uh, behind Code Ocean. So Code Ocean is built on uh, Docker, uh, Docker container technology and Linux technology. It supports any open source programming language. 
So it supports our studio, uh, Jupyter Lab, uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and CodeOcean also does currently support a couple of proprietary languages uh, such as Stata and MATLAB. And CodeOcean supports deep learning frameworks. Uh, I mentioned Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebooks. And of course, it utilizes scalable computing power uh, on the cloud using Amazon Web Services. And a quick note about preservation strategy, because this is uh, also very important. So CodeOcean does preserve the compute capsule, uh, which I will uh, describe momentarily. This is really the heart of the computational uh, workbench of CodeOcean. And so CodeOcean makes sure that all of the code, the data, the computational environment results in the metadata are preserved. And they're stored in uh, AWS S3 with a backup uh, preservation layer in Amazon Glacier. And for subscribing institutions, there is a still further preservation layer uh, using clocks. And so not only is CodeOcean a robust uh, development platform, but like protocols, it is also a, a publisher, a publishing platform as well. And so CodeOcean has actually um, you know, forged uh, partnerships with several different uh, publishers, publications, um, whereby CodeOcean is actually embedded within the submission workflows uh, for a number of different journals, a number of different publications. And so researchers, as they're working on their computational research, uh, once they finish their compute capsule in CodeOcean, uh, they will submit that compute capsule to CodeOcean, uh, where a team of algorithmic engineers will verify the code. Um, they will remain agnostic as to uh, the quality of the research, but they do provide code verification to uh, guarantee to the publisher that this compute capsule is in fact reproducible. Um, that it does uh, that it does run, and so many different ways in which CodeOcean does uh, support initiatives around uh, open research, uh, sharing of data, and and so on. And before I jump into the platform, I wanted to uh, just quickly uh, summarize what I've discussed so far. I think this slide does a nice job of doing this. And so really there are two major pillars to the CodeOcean platform. In the first place, it is uh, an asset management tool. And so I think um, with CodeOcean, the out with the outputs that are produced on CodeOcean, these really are first class uh, research artifacts, the code, the underlying code and data that aren't always adequately captured in the published article that are very often lost. Um, CodeOcean provides institutions with a mechanism for managing all of these compute capsules, um, for preserving, preserving these compute capsules, everything published on the platform, uh, all of the compute capsules published on CodeOcean um, are given a, a minted DOI. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned uh, earlier, CodeOcean also does provide researchers with a very robust computational workbench with all, um, you know, all open source uh, coding languages and computational tools available to the researcher without having to worry about any interoperability issues. And then tying it all together, very much like protocols, uh, is uh, really the heart of CodeOcean is facilitating collaboration um, within institutions and across institutions uh, to make sure that the research being produced um, uh, on CodeOcean or using CodeOcean is more rigorous and more reproducible. And so with that, I would like to jump out of uh, the deck here and uh, give you a quick tour of the CodeOcean platform. And so I actually wanna work backwards um, through my presentation, starting with the publishing piece and then working back to showing you how CodeOcean is uh, as a development, use development tool as well. And so right now I'm on the explore page uh, on the CodeOcean platform. Uh, everything published on the CodeOcean platform is, uh, is open access. Everything is free to read, uh, free to share. You can go into the explore page and you can search uh, capsules by, by discipline, by subject area, by institution, by region. And so of course, for this presentation, I did uh, conduct a search for Hong Kong University and while we know that there are uh, a lot of CodeOcean users uh, from Hong Kong University as of the time of this presentation, um, there were no uh, published compute capsules on the platform, which is fine because again, researchers always have the choice 
as to whether they want to keep their capsules private or publish it. Um, but I did find a lot of, uh, there are a lot of published capsules. Uh, what you see here from uh, nearby institutions, there are a lot of uh, capsules from Hong Kong Baptist University, uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, so if you are curious as to what researchers in your region or at your institution are using Code Ocean for, it's very easy to do so from the platform. And as you can see, um, in the Hong Kong area, there's a lot of uh, a lot of research being done in bioinformatics, uh, computer science, and, and so on. And so I mentioned earlier that Code Ocean is uh, it's also embedded within the submission workflows for several different publishers. This can be done in a number of different ways, and uh, I just wanted to show you a quick example of this. Uh, so right now, what we're looking at is a uh, published article out of F1000 research on human and mouse comparative gene expression data. Uh, so Code Ocean does have uh, an agreement, a partnership with F1000 to verify um, the computational code of researchers. And so as I scroll down about halfway through this platform, and this is again, this is the article, I come to the Code Ocean. Uh, compute capsule widget. And so this is really um, the computational workbench that researchers use while on the Code Ocean platform. And what you can do in F1000 and many other different publications is researchers are encouraged um, to actually embed their compute capsule directly into the article or to embed their capsule into uh, the citations. Lots of different ways that you can do this. And so anyone who is reading this article they can come down to the Code Ocean Compute Capsule and without having to go anywhere else, they're able to go in, they can look at the code, they can look at the data, they can look at the computational environment um, for this particular Compute Capsule. If they have an account uh, on Code Ocean, they can even perform a reproducible run um, directly, in, in, directly from the Code Ocean widget and it will rerun the code uh, in the cloud. Uh, so again, just one of many different ways that Code Ocean is making it easier than ever for researchers to openly share their data, share their code, share their research. And so suppose um, now I want to jump directly into the Code Ocean platform and show you some of the core functionality. And let's suppose that I am doing a similar kind of research um, to what these researchers were doing here. And so now I'm in the Code Ocean uh, platform proper. And as you can see, it's, uh, this is the compute capsule. It looks identical to uh, the Code Ocean widget that you just saw. Um, but a Code Ocean compute capsule is a combination of the metadata. Um, if you draw your attention to the files on the left-hand side here, a compute capsule is made up of the metadata, the computational environment, uh, all of the code, the data, the results, and all of that is packaged within a Docker file container. And so really, as I mentioned Docker earlier, Docker really is uh, embedded within the DNA of Code Ocean itself. Um, it's containerizing the code and making sure that all of the data, all of the code needed to, to run the capsule are always contained uh, within the compute capsule. And so as to ensure uh, reproducibility. So Code Ocean does uh, guarantee that um, Compute capsules will be reproducible if they are uh, made publicly available. And so this, as you'll notice uh, on the top left hand side here, this is a published capsule as indicated by uh, the blue button here. Um, and I want to jump into the metadata quickly uh, just to show you uh, here you will find uh, descriptive information about the compute capsule that we're looking at. <clears throat> Every published capsule is minted uh, with a DOI uh, through DataCite. If there are any associated publications um, with this compute capsule, and obviously there is, we had just uh, looked at it here, you will find the link to the article here. And uh, another, um, <clears throat> another option that is available for subscribing institutions is we're actually able to, Code Ocean is actually able to build a link between uh, the compute capsule and an institutional repository. And so this is really designed to help institutions to better be able to capture and curate these specific kinds of research outputs uh, that once again are, are very often lost or inadequately captured in, uh, in the final article. 
So now still being remaining on the on the published compute capsule here, I can do a couple of different things. Uh, again, I can look at the computational environment. Uh, you can see that these researchers used R. I can actually go in and take a look at the code and uh, the data. I can perform a reproducible run. Um, but again, Code Ocean uh, really is designed in part to make it easier for researchers to uh, build upon the life cycle of research and to save them a tremendous amount of time in doing so. So if I am doing a similar kind of research uh, to this compute capsule here, I can actually first duplicate the capsule. And once this compute capsule has been duplicated. Uh, I will see a message here that uh, now that it is duplicated, I can edit the capsule. And you'll notice that uh, the button in the upper left-hand corner has changed from publish to private. So now I have made this compute capsule my own. And uh, now that I have made it private, I can go in and I can run my own data sets uh, against the data sets that the authors uh, were running in the original published compute capsule. Um, I can change the code. I can change the uh, computational environment if I want to. I'm able to go in. I can add different packages uh, to the computational environment. And here, I think, is a key area in which Code Ocean really does reduce the amount of time that researchers have to spend on their computational research um, because they don't have to spend um, really any time rebuilding a computational environment for, from scratch. This can save researchers time, and this can also save professors uh, time as well. If they are deploying Code Ocean in the lab or classroom, um, they don't have to rebuild the environment for each and every student. Uh, they can simply um, set up an environment um, straight from the, the Code Ocean toolbox. And so again, um, <clears throat> Code Ocean is also a, a, a collaboration platform, uh, very similar to protocols.io. And uh, they do make it easy to invite collaborators uh, to work on your uh, compute capsule, whether you're building upon a previously published capsule as I'm pretending to do here, or whether you're building a capsule from scratch. And all you have to do uh, to invite collaborators is to enter the email addresses of your prospective collaborators. So just as an example, I'm going to add my colleague, my EBSCO colleague, Mike, um, who does nothing but code in his free time. Uh, so, one, so once I've added Mike, um, you'll see his email domain here. And I would do that for each individual uh, that I want to add to my compute capsule. And then I can assign them uh, permissions. Uh, in the case of Mike here, I can choose to make Mike the owner of the capsule. I can assign him editing rights, which I would likely do if we're going to collaborate on a capsule together or I can restrict him to viewer rights. And so once I assign him permissions and I click save, Mike will receive, and all of my prospective collaborators will receive an email with a link uh, to an invitation to collaborate on, um, on our compute capsule. So it's very easy to uh, induce collaboration within the lab uh, or again across institutions as well. And now in terms of actually working in the Code Ocean environment, uh, again, now that I've made this uh, a capsule my own, I'm able to go in and make changes. I can uh, manage my data sets. If I want to, I can actually pull data sets from places like GitHub or Dataverse. Um, I can even import, um, import files from my local machine if I want to do that. Uh, lots of different ways that you can make changes. Um, and while I can conduct all of my work in the Code Ocean IDE, users don't have to stay here. So if you have a researcher who is accustomed to working in our studio, for example, and in this case, um, they used R, um, Code Ocean will allow you to, uh, to launch a, a cloud workstation in our studio. Um, so that will open up a native cloud workstation for our studio. And every change that I make uh, while in the cloud workstation, um, whenever I do shut it down, everything, uh, all of my changes will synchronize back to my original uh, Code Ocean compute capsule. So users don't have to stay uh, within Code Ocean. They're able to launch their favorite cloud workstation um, as they would like. So lots of different ways that they can make changes um, to the actual uh, compute capsule. And the last thing I want to uh, touch on, because I know I'm coming up on time, um, but just to close the loop on the publication side of things, um, 
once you do make changes to uh, to your compute capsule, and unfortunately, I'm not uh, I'm not a coder. No, oh, actually, this is it's interesting. Let me try this again. Going to duplicate the capsule again just to show this particular part here. So if I do want to make any changes to the code, I'm just going to add three lines. Uh, again, I'm not a coder, but you can imagine a more meaningful change here. Um, you'll notice because CodeOcean does support version control, um, if you look on the left-hand side here, the green buttons signify that no changes have been made. Yellow buttons do signify that change has been made. And obviously I've made a change to the code and the metadata. And so what I would want to do is once I do make a change uh, over on the right-hand side, I would simply describe, uh, write a description for the change. Um, we'll just say added three lines, click on commit changes. And so now you'll see again that all of these buttons have reverted to, uh, to green. Uh, now again, let's assume that I am ready. I'm at the point where I want to submit my compute capsule for publication. Um, so I'm going to come over here on the right-hand side, click the Submit for Publication button. Uh, and again, CodeOcean ensures that every published compute capsule is in fact reproducible. And so once you do submit for publication, uh, you see a list come up of really stringent criteria that you have to meet, that your capsule has to meet rather, uh, before you're able to successfully submit it for publication. You have to make sure that you have your metadata field um, filled out. Uh, of course, you need to make sure that you have performed at least one successful uh, reproducible run. And then once you do that, uh, the compute cat, your compute capsule is then submitted to CodeOcean uh, and their team of algorithmic engineers will, will verify the code, uh, remain agnostic as to the, the quality um, of the research, but they will verify that it is reproducible. And, um, and then there are uh, several different ways, as I mentioned earlier, to, to share your code or to embed your compute capsule into the final, uh, at, the, at the point of publication. So I think I'm coming up on, uh, on time here. And that was a very quick, uh, quick tour of CodeOcean. I hope it gave you all a, uh, a decent idea of how the platform functions, uh, why it's important and uh, we're certainly as excited about CodeOcean as we are uh, protocols.io. And uh, in the time I have, I'm happy to uh, take any questions. I'll uh, do my best to, to answer them. Uh, but if I don't have an answer for you at the moment, I will certainly get one to you um, as soon as possible. So thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Robert. Uh, it's good to know CoOcean can help researchers computationally reproduce someone's research output. Uh, we have um, received several questions. So the first one is, if there is GitHub, why should I use CoOcean? Robert, Great. please. Sure. Great question. So the way that I like to think about the difference between a place like GitHub in Code Ocean, and, uh, and I think Lenny had mentioned this. GitHub is it, it is a great uh, a great place as a, re a repository. Um, but the way that I think of the difference between a place like GitHub and Code Ocean is that while uh, because I do like food analogies, um, GitHub does provide you with a recipe. It does provide you. It tells you all of the ingredients that you need to actually run your code. But you still have to make sure that you have the right, uh, the right hardware on your machine, that you have uh, a lot of the, the steps that I had mentioned at the top of my presentation of those traditional steps. Whereas CodeOcean takes care of that entire process for you. And uh, with CodeOcean, they don't just give you the recipe, but they give you uh, a guaranteed um, prepared meals with guaranteed taste. Um, I like to think of the meal boxes that we have in the States, uh, like HelloFresh, CodeOcean is HelloFresh. Um, and GitHub um, gives you the recipe. So there are certainly key, key functional differences between uh, CodeOcean and, uh, and GitHub. Um, the second question is, for code capsules, how does credit work if I build on someone else's code capsule? Right, so the original, the original code capsules do, um, do have the DOI but they are minted with a DOI. 
And if, uh, if a researcher is building upon um, a previously published capsule, um, there, there will be credit assigned to that original, uh, the original compute capsule that the new author has built upon, um, but they will have their own, uh, their own DOI uh, for, their, uh, for their own capsule. Okay, thank you, Rob. Uh, please allow me to pass the session to Jesse. Jesse, it's all yours. Oh, I share my screen. So uh, good, good morning, everyone. So I'm Jesse Xiao, Data and Scholarly Communication Librarian from Hong Kong Libraries. So it is our pleasure to uh, co-host this webinar with EBSCO to talk about open science uh, with our speaker, Learning, Rob, and Scott. So my presentation is about um, uh, is about opening up, promoting, and preserving the university research from our library research services. So. Uh, you may realize that the traditional publishing mode, so the reader and the user can only view the results and the article from the journal, but probably they may not be able to touch the data, fig, and the protocols. And it will be difficult to uh, reproduce the research result. So for the traditional um, publishing model, uh, our library provides the linear research support services based on the um, publishing mode and uh, publishing stages. So for the future open research publishing, so the author not only publish the article, so they also need to deposit or open the research data and provide the tools and the work for open the software source code and uh, to make the research result more reproducible. So uh, the reader and the user can assess the article with linked the data tools workflow, etc. So based on the uh, open research publishing trend, so the university librarian, uh, libraries will provide the uh, complex dynamic and the connect research services to promote the open research and the open science. So in our library, so we provide the research data services, uh, sustainable digital scholarship services, open access services, and the OA uh, and the OAE general platform to open and promote and preserve our university research. So for the research data services, so the University of Hong Kong has the policy on research data and the record management, and you may find the policy in our university research services uh, website. So it mentions the uh, university uh, recognizes that the accurate and the retrievable research data are essential component of any research project and uh, necessary to verify and defend when required. And also it mentioned the research data and the record should be returned as long as they are of continuity value. And the minimal uh, retention period for research data and the record uh, is three years. So uh, according to this policy, our library um, provide list of uh, research data services to support it. So including our uh, research data services platform and DMP tools and platform, our data repository, data hub. So we also provide the uh, data curation and data publishing services and host a list of research data workshop about how to uh, write the DMP, how to do the data submission and also introduce a new uh, data tools and the platform to our uh, university research and student. So our research data platform uh, uh, integrate all the data services and the functions. A student and the researcher can log in to our platform to submit the DMP and the supervisor and the department head can also log in to approve it. And the platform also linked with the, our data repository DMP tool and also it provide our uh, data workshop news. So we have the DMP tool at Hong Kong U libraries and uh, set the DMP template for the student and the researchers. So until now we get uh, more than uh, 1,800 uh, active users and with more than 3,100 uh, submitted DMPs. So every semester we will host the data management plan workshop to, the, to our student and the researcher about how to prepare the DMP. 
So our uh, data repository, Data Hub, so it is a comprehensive institutional data repository for research data and uh, any other form of scholarly output. So it uh, powered by Fixture. So this is the, our data repository URL here. So there are several features for our data repository. So you can access your data anywhere. So we have a secure cloud platform and every uh, RPG student and the staff will get 100 gigabyte um, private storage by default. And you can easily apply more storage by in your account. And also if you're sharing data in our data repository, you will get the credit. So you will get the unique uh, data set DOI for your published data set. And also you can reserve you reserve a DOI before your data get published. For the access right control, so you can uh, set your data as a confidential, or you can also set the embargo periods for your data set. And for sharing and uh, collaborative, so you can generate the private link for your data and share with your collaborator also or you can uh, create a project and invite your um, project member to join the project and we share the data. So our library research data team also provide the basic uh, data curation services to make sure the published data are fulfill the file data principle with the enriched metadata. So as I just mentioned, so all published data in our uh, data hub are fulfilled the file data principle, which means your data are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So our uh, data hub is registered in the uh, IE three data, is registry of research data repository, and also in the file sharing. So for the um, published data set in our data hub, so here is the example. So you will see uh, uh, we have the DOI here. So every um, published data set will get the DOI. And also uh, the data hub data is a version controllable. So you can easily load back to different versions. And in the published record page, you will see the keyword here and the categories. Also, you will find the finding information. You will see uh, this, this data set uh, submitted by Dr. Lang. So uh, this data actually linked with some uh, UCC, UCC grant and some uh, and, um, one NSF grant. And also you can select lessons. Yes. So for, for this example, so the data is linked with the peer reviewed publications. So you can also link with your data with the publication in our data hub. And also you will see the metrics here. So you will see the number of view, number of download, downloads. And also you will see the automatic plugin here. So, so for um, data curation, so we provide the uh, readme file template to do and the do the data curation for all the new data set to ensure the data set contain the readme file and the, some basic metadata information such as the general information including title uh, creators and some sharing and assess information data and the file overview methodological information and the data specific information etc so after so after the curation, the metadata will fulfill the data set metadata standard. So which include some um, uh, creators, uh, DOIs, uh, funding reference, and uh, some related identifies those uh, metadata records. So with the uh, enriched metadata, so all data set published in our data hub are searchable in the uh, Google datasets, data set search. So you may wish to see uh, the search result example here. So, uh, so to improve our RPG student thesis reproducibility, so we linked the research data with the RPG student thesis in our new scholars hub, which is still under development. So I can I can share this mocha page right now. So here is the example, the student thesis. So if it associates with the research data, you can click the uh, supplementary materials here to view the data set associated with this thesis. And then you can uh, quickly preview the research data 
uh, associated with the scissors and you can directly download it or you can click to go to the data hub page to get more information about this data set. Okay, so with the fixture uh, data preview features, so user can directly preview the data on the web browser from um, from data hub, such as you can um, preview the video, 3D mode, and uh, uh, map, and also you can uh, uh, quickly preview the large zip file. So you may not need to wait long time to download the large zip file. So you, instead of you can preview it, uh, preview it on your browser. So to promote the open data and the open research, so we host different data and the tool workshops, such as uh, web scraping, Tableau, Altex, and Argis, etc. So also we will identify the new um, open research tools and the platform, then provide the training, or we can consider to subscribe it for Hong, for Hong Kong researchers. Uh, such as this time, we find the protocol.io to share in the protocol and the code ocean to share in and publish the uh, script and the software. So from last year until now, we have total around uh, 18 um, data workshops with the number of attendants is around 1,400. So we just launched the um, uh, Hong Kong U Library Sustainable Digital Scholarship. So Hong Kong U uh, community member um, can have their data of ongoing project or future project host on data hub for collaboration and the long term assess. So we can help to uh, migrating past and the current project data to data hub to and also we can set up the uh, customized page on the data hub for the new project. And also we can provide the training session, the guideline about how to use the data hub to preserve your project data. So uh, this one use case is uh, is about the IPCP project, which is the intergenerational uh, um, participatory co-design project. So was the knowledge exchange and the research collaboration projects co organized by different units in uh, Hong Kong U. So we create the uh, so we create the specialized collection page and the data from three uh, sub project in this IPCP project are organized in the structured directory and the published items are uh, open accessible by public and other private items are stored in the data hub for archive and would not be public accessible. So another um, another example is the anti-traditional uh, is anti-traditional amend amendment bill research project. So the project has the website to display the information, but for the project data itself, so it deposit on the data hub and the linked with the uh, with the project website. <laughs> Um, we will host uh, co-host another uh, webinar with fixture about how to security and um, securely store your project data and the supplementary material on our data hub. So if you are the Hong Kong U um, researcher and the student, so you may wish to scan uh, this QR code or click this link to register. So it is in this Friday afternoon. So the, the webinar will include the essential features such as uploading, storing, publishing your research data on GitHub. Also, we will introduce how to use uh, the APIs and FTP or GitHub to more easily uh, transfer your data to uh, to GitHub. So the next one is um, uh, open access services. So, so this one is uh, about the, um, the first one is a transformative agreement. So it aims to uh, redirect the funding into academic publishing from uh, supporting uh, subscription to supporting OA publishing. So the libraries in UGC funded university has uh, have start to explore some how transformative agreement can benefit the researchers in Hong Kong. So we have working together to negotiate and assign some transformative agreement with individual uh, publishers. So we will further discuss the OA chain and consider how to find the transformative agreement in the long run. 
So here it's, it's the list of the publisher. So some we have the some we have signed the OA agreement such as Cargo, and some we have get the APC discount for Hong Kong U authors. So if you wish to if you wish to know more about the uh, open access at Hong Kong U library, so you can access our libguide URL is here. And also in our new Scores Hub, so we will show the publications um, open access status by integrate with the unpayable services. So also we have the version filter to select the preprint, postprint, or final version of Hong Kong U publication in the new Scores Hub. So in the individual publication page, so you will see the, uh, the links for full text. So our Scores Hub team will check the publisher policy to see if we can provide the preprint or postprint collected from the Hong Kong U researchers. So it also show the uh, green, green OA status for this publication from the unpayable. So the user can quickly get the preprint or postprint uh, version by click this link. So if we don't have uh, don't have it in our scores hub, you user can easily get it from um, from unpayable. So la the last one is the uh, e-journal services. So it is the free new hosting services provided um, by the university library to assist uh, faculty and the research center to in publishing open access journal. So this service will include hosting support uh, run on the open source open journal system. So which is OGS. So in, so we will provide the training and the support the OGS software. And also we will um, design the general website and the layout services. And uh, we will provide the consultation on educational, you know, edit, uh, editor, editorial workflow and the management. So the library also assists in assigning the uh, digital object identified DOIs as we well are the cross ref members so we can assign the DOI for your um, for your articles. So if you are the Hong Kong U researchers, you may contact us to host the OA journals in our OGS platform. Yeah, so I use the well to um, export the open science characteristic and the indicators. So the open science refer to uh, ongoing changes in the way researcher, the, in the way research is conducted. So for researcher learn self through increasing the use of open access scientific publishing and the open data, open research tool to make to make the research result more reproducible. For the public through increasing the understanding of the uh, participation in the science. And for our librarians, so we can still recognize and discuss a lot for uh, open science movement. So science, it is a trend. So we can pay attention to our patient to see. So if they, uh, if they have a need or request toward the open science practice, so we, we can provide the um, uh, research data services, provide the preprint or postprint archive. We can also negotiate the transformative agreement with the publisher. So we can also help the researcher to try out some uh, open science tools such as protocol.io and the co-ocean in this webinar. Yeah, so uh, that's all for my presentation. So I have shared my slides in our um, data hub. So you may wish to assess this slide by the DOI link here or scan the QR code. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, it's great to learn the achievements by HQ, HKUL. So uh, we got several questions. So the first one is, uh, from libraries perspectives, uh, how to play the role as a hub to collaborate or connect researchers activities on open workflow tools? Uh, 
Yes, so it is a great question. So uh, actually, we are uh, actually we are collect the requirement from different uh, fl from different uh, university stakeholder to see they have any uh, requirements such as uh, uh, for such as for this uh, open research data. So we realize some uh, faculty actually they have the uh, requirement for the data storage, how to share data, how to store data for the project. So that's why we provide the sustainable digital digital scholarship uh, services and also recently we um, we 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 provide these services for some researchers from uh, faculty of social science and the faculty of medicine to let them use um, the use the services to uh, preserve the project data yeah so we will explore uh, uh, more tools and uh, more um, platform to provide to our university researcher Thank you, Jesse. Uh, another question is for data sharing, how can we enable sharing with all local university, all local university researchers? So for data sharing, so right now in our uh, data repository, we can allow you to to share um, the first the, the first um, the first one is you can just share your metadata and keep your data file as private. Also, you can choose you can share your data in your faculty. So we have different uh, group settings. So for faculty department, so you can only share your data in your faculty or department. But we cannot say um, can only share in the local Hong Kong University. So we can we can control so to only share data in Hong Kong U, but we cannot control to only share data in the Hong Kong region. Thank you. Uh, another one is what proportion of RPG students are making their data open? Uh, so, um, yes, yeah, so <laughs> that is good. So, uh, good question. So actually it's not very large proportion. So I think just 20, 20 or 30 percent RPG students are making their data open. So the still have uh, most part of RPG students, they set the, the data as confidential or they have set the embargo period one year or two years. Yeah, because they say they will, um, they will, uh, those data will use in some other publication in future. So they set the uh, embargo period and uh, confidential. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jesse. So please allow me to hand over the time to Scott. Scott, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Abel. Thanks, uh, Ethan and Jesse, for doing the heavy lifting, setting up such a brilliant. Um, such a brilliant workshop here. Um, and thank uh, uh, Robert and Lenny for, for um, uh, doing brilliant introduction on the, on the platforms that I wanna to talk to, right? It's, it's standing on the shoulders of giants. I don't need to uh, give background on them and I can instead present a kind of in the wild uh, use case um, of how we, uh, what you can actually do with these, do with these platforms. Um, and um, this particular use case is as a, a sort of open science journal, but I hope to get across that you can do all of these things in your own workflow, right? You don't have to publish with um, uh, Giga Science journals. You can, uh, there's advantages of doing this stuff yourself. And ultimately it lets you, it brings a different perspective. Um, you can bring your research to life in, in different ways. Um, beyond viewing it as static PDFs to so something you know you can interact with and and view any which way you like, even uh, 3D printing it and viewing it on a virtual reality headset. Um, it was uh, great, Lenny kicking things off, his um, fast versus uh, slow science kind of really um, got this across perfectly, um, you know, how, how important this is, how we should always be working like this, but uh, uh, one thing that the pandemic, uh, coronavirus pandemic has done is really bring, at least people appreciate how important science is and show the, uh, you know, some, some of, some of the, the, the issues that where there's a lack of data, um, vacuum kind of uh, can be filled with, with conspiracy theories. You know, Hong Kong is amongst the highest uh, 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 anti-vaccine skepticism in the entire world. Um, and, you know, on top of this kind of information and trust uh, deficit, there's a, a glut of kind of speculation as well. So we need a way to, to address this stuff and, you know, scientific research 
has kind of filled this. Um, but uh, it, 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 it's really interesting that the, at, the, at the forefront of this are uh, not just narrative publications, but the, but the data and the code. And um, the, the, if, if you've been following the, all of the issues around the notorious Imperial College Report 9, uh, never has there been such scrutiny on research software um, this one uh, model, this one piece of software was directly responsible for the lockdown policies in the UK and the US. And so much pushback, so much scrutiny, so much criticism in the, you know, the Daily Telegraph saying that this uh, model, this software was the most devastating software mistake of all time. And the way that we've shared research has not really been fit for purpose for kind of addressing these issues. The, but the vehicle that you know academia has been to like fill these information gaps has the vehicle has been the scientific publication right this is how we communicate these things we need to disseminate and communicate this information openly and globally but unfortunately the way that we've done this is is expensive and there are many barriers such as paywalls um holding this back um, to you know, to fit to fill this gap, we need to share this information uh, quickly as possible, and and it needs to be in a trusted form, which people uh, generally have felt uh, you know the best mechanism of this is peer review. Um, but unfortunately, the way we do this is extremely laborious. The technology we do to the, do with this is is archaic and from the 1990s, and the process is just a, it's just a black box, right? It's completely untransparent. You don't know how this peer review is being carried out. Um, as with the, the um, uh, Ferguson example, the, the things we need in this data-driven era, the, the data, the software, the tools and models need to be shared in a way that you know, we, can, we can scrutinize and reuse these things. But everything has been focused on narrative, right? It's hard work to make you know, code like Ferguson's sh shared, but there's been little incentive to do, to do this effort, right? It's left as an afterthought and we see the, see the consequences. And we need this to, you know, to build trust. We need this understandable by, by our politicians, by our, policy, by our policymakers, by the general public. And there are many, many barriers, including language, including technical jargon and the inability to, to interact with these things, right? We are attack, attack, tackling a 21st century a crisis with technology from the 17th century, essentially, right? So um, we really need to regain trust. And um, my favorite quote relating to this is from Buckhart and Donohoe in the 90s that scholarly articles are merely advertisements of scholarship. The actual artifacts that we need, the data and the computational methods that support this are, are essentially in inaccessible. And so we need to move from this advertising to, to evidence, right? We need, we need transparency. We need to see the, you know, under the hood of this process and we need to give credit to the, the digital objects that we need, the data, the software, the methods, and we need to treat them as for the first class objects of research that they are in this data-driven era. So this is why GigaScience launched um, back in 2012. And we first tackled these cultural issues, um, publishing specific papers for crediting the sharing of open data that we call data notes, and uh, papers for the sharing of open source software that we call technical notes. But what we did differently from other journals is um, we also uh, set up a, uh, a data repository um, called GigaDB. And um, this uh, gave uh, data site DOIs. And so if there weren't subject specific repositories for this data, basically nothing, you know, there are no excuses for things to fall through the gaps. We can take snapshots of code. We can take um, any, any data type, no limits with size. And we would cover all of this it's, and, the, and curation as well, experienced curators holding the hands and helping the researchers. And this is all covered in our article processing charge. Um, so uh, nearly a decade, we've been collecting all of these examples. We've been collecting all of this data. And once you have the data or, and, the, and the basic code, you can start doing things with this, right? The next step is, is interaction, bringing these, these things to life. And so we've had some cool examples of, this in, of these kinds of integrations. Um, one that hasn't been mentioned so far is, is Publons. Um, so we're very into uh, transparency and openness, 
and we made the whole uh, peer review process completely transparent, mandated open named peer review. And our reviewers do, you know, reviewers need to be credited for this stuff, right? They need to get credit for their hard work. So we would give data site DOIs to um, all of our of all of our names reviews, and you can even stick these on your orchids, right? Get credit for doing this really important work. So um, we, using our GigaDB database, um, we, we have the flexibility to add widgets on top of the data, visualization tools for, for genomics data, for, for 3D models and imaging data um, with Sketchfab and, and, and CodeOcean as well, right? Um, a nice CodeOcean example here um, from an author who's actually now at, at HKU uh, and, and um, protocols.io as well. Um, and uh, yeah, it, uh, it's, I'm so pleased to be doing this with Lenny because we've been, 2016 was the first uh, protocols that we, that we showcased, like it's gone so quickly. Um, and Lenny's done a brilliant job explaining how this works. Um, what we have done a, a bit differently is uh, having on hand curators and, and sort of data experts, we can also work with authors to input their protocols, or if there are relevant protocols that may only need a slight tweak or are actually perfect, we can curate protocol collections with them. And um, these are then cited in the papers, and uh, we've been able to also embed these in GigaDB. And as you know, Lenny has really showed, this imp improves the reproducibility, the discoverability, and this whole almost kind of social network uh, side to it allows a greater collaboration. So um, having software, um, another, another um, experiment we've been doing in the last, uh, last year is um, this scheme called Code Check. And um, this is a, a independent kind of third party group that actually does an independent execution of the computations underlying these research articles, right? So they, they kind of have tools, they have protocols and they have people who will basically do independent timestamped runs. Um, and uh, if they can regenerate the figures in your paper, you get a certificate of executable computation, right? And this then you can cite this in your, in your paper. Um, great kind of project for students. They're actually looking for new code checkers. Um, but our first example was published uh, just over a year ago, really nice data uh, machine learning tool that um, was, it was independently um, executable and got one of these certificates. Um, but shortly after this, um, the platform got extremely topical and um, because uh, one of the, the, the next things that they, they tested it on was the notorious um, report nine, right? So they got Neil Ferguson's code called a horrible buggy mess um, but they managed to actually make it reproducible, right? They've given uh, Ferguson the thumbs up. His code may be messy, you know, it wasn't designed to be shared um, in this manner. He had other things to do, like, you know, saving the world, for example. But, um, but uh, they've managed to show that, like, it works, right? This code actually works. And uh, this, you know, so much of this criticism from the Daily Telegraph, those code experts that they are, was unfair. And so this shows the, the, the you know, a, a amazing things you can do to rebuild trust, having access to code um, and, and kind of do, and data and doing things on top of it. So um, nearly a decade on from GigaScience, we, we've been we're pretty pleased with uh, many of the things that we achieved, but we didn't, we, we have kind of been held back in a way by, by you know, a lot of things we really wanted to do, technology has held us back. And, a f and the main thing holding us back is, the, is publishing technology. The platforms that we use are extremely expensive, extremely slow. If you want to add an integration, you tell your kind of third party vendor and it takes literally years to, to do this and can cost obscene amounts of money. Um, and then the structure of the, the scientific paper as well is still very focused on the narrative. So journals are supposed to be offering this thing version of record, um, but everything has been very focused on, on, on the packaging, right? And, the, and rather than the actual, the, the, the data, the code, the usable things there, these are the things we should 
um, really be focused on and, and that, that the rest is, is, isn't so important, right? Static narrative um, is, is all well and good, but we can really think about once you have the data, once you have the code, to move publishers towards actually curating the, the kind of dynamic results, right? Uh, think more as a, as a curator than a, than a publisher um, that, that you can, you know, you've got, the, you've got these key objects and then you can display them in many, many ways. So this, uh, this, this, this nice meme on Twitter is like, hey, what about a second Giga Journal? So to do this, we started working with River Valley Technologies, an amazing tech company in the UK and India, that at the same time we were thinking these things, they've been working on this um, XML only complete end to end uh, publishing pipeline. Rather than uh, traditional pipelines, which have many, many things kind of bolted together, um, this sort of API spaghetti you see on the left, um, everything is much simpler by having everything from one integration point. And so what that means is everything is acting as one platform, no import export of files, things don't fall through the gaps, right? There's speed and accuracy gained from that, but many other things. It, working purely in XML cuts out the production, um, automates this, like the vast majority of this production step, and this massively increases, uh, I mean, reduces the time and cost um, of, of this stage. Our traditional partners would literally take a month we've managed to spit papers through in as little as three hours and at like a dramatic, uh, you know, re reducing this cost barrier as well. Doing everything in XML has is, uh, is allowed you to do, to do things very differently as well. Publish instant, instantly, change, uh, just spit out a, a PDF in real time, update and fork this in a similar way to, you know, protocols and code ocean, uh, instantaneous switching the views, and uh, dynamic content, um, much more easy to, to spit it in. It effectively just doesn't slow down the production process at all. Whereas if you wanted to add a new integration through traditional platforms, we've literally asked for some of these things over two years ago and still don't have them. And um, th this cool tech meant, okay, we wanted to launch a new journal, focus on forkable things, um, data and software, for example. And so um, to give a little example, I'm not brave enough to do a live demo, but um, a little video here shows you can click a button and change the language. Um, you can click another button and change the, the fonts to, you know, for visually impaired, dyslexic fonts, for example. You can switch a click a button and change the entire view of the paper. This is the, the lens view example, but you can view papers in any way that the you know, human, human can really imagine. So, um, and I talked about dynamic content. Um, what this allows is um, you can build things on top of, of your data and your results. Visualization tools of any type of data type, for example, um, here's an example of high C maps, for example, that, you know, ever any, any data, you can kind of have a tool like this. In gigabytes, we can embed video content. Simple things such as video or, um, imaging data, viewing 3D models. If you like the model, um, then you can just push a button, download it, send it to your 3D printer, send it to your virtual reality headset. Um, protocols, as I mentioned, uh, are brilliant, you know, a, a stepwise protocol is so much more logical way of having your materials and methods than uh, some kind of impenetrable narrative list. So we stick the collections in, in our materials and methods instead. Um, code Ocean as well, um, hat tip to them that we can embed uh, Code Ocean windows too. So, um, you know, coming back to, uh, you know, most topical examples, um, a few months ago, uh, Gigabyte, um, this new journal has published its first uh, coronavirus related paper. And this um, related to uh, uh, immunoinformatics tool, right? A, a software tool that looks at, um, at the epitopes um, 
in, um, in memory T cells, for example, right? So there's a big area of controversy and debate in, in uh, coronavirus research that uh, do we have um, immunity from previous exposure to common cold coronaviruses, right? All of these arguments about why different places have higher death rates and the like. So very, very, um, uh, you know, contentious area of research. And this is a tool that, uh, one tool of many that, you know, can help answer this question. So, um, you know, we need, we need people to trust these things. And so um, we use this example and the authors did a brilliant, brilliant job um, with some of these tools. And uh, so I don't need to explain code ocean because uh, Robert did a fantastic job of this. But another tool that we've started collaborating with is, is called Stencilla, um, very nicely funded by eLife. Um, this is a, a little bit different from code ocean and it's, uh, you know, code ocean will focus on the whole software package. This gives a very uh, article centric view, producing an executable research article um, basically looking at the code underlying all of the individual figures. So what does this article look like? So you can see here that, um, you know, traditional uh, article view, we have a button where you can click the Stencilla view and here's a Stencilla version of the paper. You can scroll down to uh, one of the images, for example, one of the figures in the paper, there's a little I button, you click on this and then you get the underlying code um, that, that supported this paper. And uh, if you're a coder, you can tweak, tweak this, um, make, you know, make little changes, and, and it automatically updates in, in real time. Uh, scrolling down, they also have a code ocean example embedded in here. If you want a complete uh, software, you know, a software centric view, um, again, scrutinize, tweak the code, and then as Robert showed, you can then boot it in your uh, AWS um, in your AWS account. So this really, um, th I hope that this uh, showing what this um, inter more interactive view uh, can give is that you know it it allows uh, firstly, as you know, the other speakers have, sh have shown. Um, much more reproducibility and reusability. We're showing that this stuff is actually executable and works. And hopefully it builds this trust, right? Trust is so important now. And all of these examples show that it goes beyond the, the kind of look, but don't touch. Um, previous ap approach and, and um, the other advantage of this is, is it, it's really educative, right? You can use this to train your students. Let, uh, let people see, you know, see step by step how research is done. And even the general public, um, it's giving people um, a credit for sharing these things, right? It takes a little bit more time and effort, but you're, you're getting DOIs, you're getting a, a, a new type of publication with, with us and hopefully others for, for doing these things. And, and it's more collaborative, right? You're moving towards more research, more like the software paradigm where, you know, it's kind of code release, for update and repeat. Um, so I've given this um, example for our new gigabyte journal, but you can do this in all of your own workflows, right? Even if you can't embed it in your papers, you will produce DOIs, you produce URL, URLs, it, you can put it in your other publications, put it in your teaching materials, keep it for yourself, right? Come back and like, how did this work again? Oh yeah, you know, um, he, yeah, here it is. And so just to kind of uh, summarize what, what we at Gigabyte are doing, you know, we really seeing this as a new way of publishing data-driven research, leveraging this amazing new technology, helping us to, you know, we, I really strongly believe that we need to think differently to tackle, you know, this, this fast versus slow research uh, issue. Um, the whole point of version of record really needs to be uh, rethought as well, where you're really focusing on the data, on the software, on the, on the, on the immutable facts, right? These are the things we need to really focus on, on, uh, on archiving, and then the packaging is, is irrelevant, right? You can view these things in any which way you like. Um, we want to use, we can use automation and interaction to increase uh, scrutiny and trust. And this also this automation uh, can, uh, you know, this XML example actually reduces the cost of doing this stuff, right? This XML only workflow cuts the time and costs to publish, right? This is another barrier that we can break down. 
and and we want to really share and people people to get credit for going to these efforts for sharing their their data and their software in reusable way. So, um, you know, from Gigabyte, this new platform, we've launched our own press, uh, Gigascience Press. Um, it, you know, potentially we can publish new journals um, if people have ideas for this. And if you have potential publications you want to share in this manner, for the next couple of months, article processing uh, charges are still free. Um, big team to thank around the world, you know, all our, our curators, data scientists uh, and editors, um, need to thank BGI, um, effectively my employer, for, for helping fund all of this. River, River Valley Technologies for making amazing, amazing uh, tech that this all runs on. All of our merry partners and uh, Sten Siller for this great tech. So hopefully we've got a few minutes now for some questions. Is that all good? Thank Abel? you so much, Scott. Uh, it's so nice to learn the perspective on open science from the publishing house. So uh, we got several questions. The first one, um, does the code check address version problems? For example, code that works in R3, but no longer works in R4. Scott, please. So um, they have a standard protocol and it's just a yes, no thing, but they will follow the instructions in the paper. And then it's, it's just a yes, no thing. So if it's, if the, if the, the publication and the, you know, the readme documents of the code and everything says, says the version number, then the code checker should, in theory, then use that version number and then it will work. If they haven't given that detail and they're trying it in the wrong, uh, you know, they're trying it in the wrong version of R or whatever, and it doesn't work, then it doesn't get the, you know, it, it's just a, this certificate of execution. It doesn't really tell you um, anything about the about the you know the, the science behind it or anything you know are the conclusions correct or something it gives you a yes no that based on the instructions and code that you've been given you can execute it or you can't execute it so okay thank you um, the second question is uh, will it speed up the paper or research work get published if uh, they also adopt open research tools. So we, we would like to think, right? We are giving people, we are, we for one are giving people credit for doing this and, and more and more, journal, you know, we launched our, our data journal in, in 20, our first data journal in 2012. And then the big publishers have all basically in, you know, the, the big traditional, you know, in theoretically more conservative publishers have all essentially jumped on the ba bandwagon and done the same thing. Um, and so, they see the benefit of this. Um, it, it's a it, it, it's a business model for them now, ultimately. But um, all, you know, all of the major publishers don't have issues with preprints. Um, they don't have issues. They, you know, they all have policies like in, mandating co, uh, you know data sharing. They're all bringing code sharing. Um, uh, policies. A, a lot of this isn't uh, for the good, you know, the, for the good of science or whatever. It boosts their citations ultimately, and there's, you know, uh, there's um, it, some of it is is, is self interest. But the, the publishers are, are fine in this, right? The, the researchers um, just need to. They don't need to worry about about these things. They should. Um, the, the, if, you know, the vast majority of publishers are behind this now, so um, re, re, you know, researchers can. Can, can do this stuff, no problem. Thank you, Scott. All right, let's enter the final portion of the event discussion session. I will pass the session to Ethan. Hey, Ethan, you are good to go. We have several questions that have been submitted by the audience. And just a reminder for everyone, if you still have questions that you have not yet submitted, please enter it in the QA box and we will get through it as many questions as time allows. So uh, we have a question, I think it's for Rob. Um, what, are the, what are the available programming language for CoOcean to do online computing? Rob, uh, Rob, I think you got muted. Sorry, could you repeat that question, Ethan? Um, what are the available programming language for CodeOcean to do online computing? 
Okay, sure. So um, I don't have um, I don't have a, a list of the available programming languages off the top of my head, but if you visit the website, if you visit codeocean.com, you can find a list of available uh, programming languages, the the open source languages, and and again. Um, uh, MATLAB and Stata are two proprietary languages that CodeOcean also supports. Uh, so you can find that information on, on the website. I apologize, I don't have that on hand. Okay. And, um, I think this one is maybe for, uh, yeah, I think it's for Lenny. Uh, Lenny, can you share more about the cases that adopting institutional solutions? Um, how do you co-work with the research and development department or the libraries? So we've been really lucky to have Carnegie Mellon, um, which is a very progressive library, be the first one to um, pilot the campus-wide license for protocols.io. And it's just been a pleasure to work with them on uh, rolling it out at the campus. So um, those licenses make it free premium um, for all teaching and research purposes on campus, unlimited workspaces, and we provide workshops, support, and we also provide import of existing protocols. So if researchers on campus um, have their protocols in the Google Doc or Word document or a PDF, they can send it to us and our editorial team will get it in, curate, check it and reassign it privately back to the researchers. So it helps to overcome barriers to adoption. Um, and since then, so that was Carnegie Mellon, then all of University of California uh, rolled it out across campuses, Stanford and many other universities over the last two years have signed up. and. It's always been, with the exception of Stanford, where it was the Office of Research, in our experience, it's always been with the library that we work together to uh, roll out uh, protocols.io uh, on, on campus, organizing workshops, providing the support, training, um, and outreach so that there is visibility and the researchers know. But it's a pretty straightforward uh, process. Right. Thank you, Lenny. Um, last question, I guess it's for Jesse, obviously. What, what's the next plan for Hong Kong uh, University Libraries open research? Uh, so for our plans, so we will um, continually promote the um, open data services. So we will promote the uh, sustainable digital and scholarship services to preserve our university um, project data. So especially for those project uh, uh, already finished the um, uh, already without the grant support so for those projects so they can move in so they can move their project data from their website or from their database to our uh, university libraries and also we will promote our e-journal services so we will um, so uh, because we already installed the uh, OGS platform in our uh, library server so we will promote the uh, e-journal services to host more uh, OA journals in our platform very exciting to know that. So um, we don't have any other questions so far, but uh, I think if you have any additional questions, you're very welcome to connect with our speakers here. They are all sharing their um, the email address and contact information in the chat box. So feel free to reach out to them. And, of course, you are very welcome to leave your comments or feedbacks uh, to our post event survey. The survey will pop out when you leave the meeting room. And I think we have to thank you to everyone who joined us today and special thanks to the University of Hong Kong Libraries. So Lenny, Rob, Jesse, Scott, thank you for sharing your insights and expertise. And Thank you for your time and have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.